Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Global Voices Spotlight, hosted by the Global Youth Advancement Network, where we interview an esteemed member of our faculty committed to development and success of youth globally. Um, my name is Jason James. I am the senior marketing major um, intern for the Global Youth Advancement Network. I have the privilege of conducting an interview with Dr. Marcy Hessling O'Neill, who is the former advisor for the Peace and Justice Society, as well as the assistant professor for anthropology. She conducted ethnographic research in Benin, West Africa for nine years, and she was also the Global Youth Summit mentor um, for the Global Youth Advancement Network. So to begin our interview, I really want to ask, can you explain some of the things that you brought for us today in the background and kind of like where they came from and the story behind them? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so what I have behind us is a series of books. We call this series Books That Bind. And we created these uh, with my colleagues at Les Trois Sœurs in Benin. Mm -hmm. And they came about because um, my colleagues noticed that there weren't many, col or many colleagues, there weren't many books that were available in the language that they speak at home for kids. Um, and so we thought of a couple of solutions to that problem and one of them would be just translate books that mm -hmm. came from other, um, other authors. But what we also thought was there's a lot of elders in the community who talk to us about telling stories and how right. storytelling was super important to them when they were kids. And they said, when we were young, we didn't go to school. Our school was underneath the mango tree and right. our elders would tell us these stories. And every story had a meaning and you would hear a certain story if you needed to hear a certain lesson. <laughs> Usually, Beautiful. maybe you've done something bad. I right. don't know, right? <laughs> so so um, what we did is I was teaching a class here at Michigan State called Globalization and Justice. Right. And at the same time, my colleagues were trying to figure out how to come up with books for kids in the community. Right. So we thought about how we could do a project together mm -hmm. and we asked the elders to tell stories. My colleagues recorded them on their smartphones and sent back the transcripts of those to, um, to me and my students at Michigan State. Right. And we used this software, it's a free software called Bloom, um, designed for ease of use mm -hmm. um, to create bilingual and trilingual books. Right. And so uh, we asked our colleagues to have the kids in the community act out the stories. So therefore, they were going to hear the story, right. act it out, sort of like embody the, the spirit of what the, the lesson of the story. Um, and then we put them into book form. So we did one version of those in 2017, mm -hmm. and we called it Books That Bind because we were bringing together the elders as well as the kids in the community right. as well as the university, you know, Michigan State and University of Abome Calavi in Benin. Um, and it really sort of just snowballed from there. We did one volume collaboratively. Then the next year, my colleagues wrote a grant proposal to the US Embassy and got a grant to do the second round mm -hmm. and to do all of the production in Benin. Mm -hmm. So um, we did workshops on um, camera work, on uh, the golden hour, right? And right. on storyboarding. And then how to transform these stories from maybe a 15 minute call and response story to something that could be put in book form that could be used in the schools right. too. Um, and, and so then from the third iteration is um, what we have in the middle, two stories, Ndelu and Zinzinklezen, mm -hmm. um, that became part of the uh, project we call Prekar, right. um, Cultural Preservation Through the Arts. Mm -hmm. And um, once again, had elders tell folk tales, but this time we gave the stories to artists. Right and the artists held camps with kids in the community, taught them um, drawing and painting and sculpture and um, acting, always using the folk tales as their inspiration, right. and chose two of those to create these two books um, illustrated by kids in the community. That's amazing, and these books are actually so beautiful, and I'm so glad that you brought all of these things for us to look at and see, because I feel like there's a lot that we can get from the art and I guess the culture back um, in places that you have been and I'm super excited to interview you and get to speak more on your experiences. I yeah. guess my first question I wanted to ask you um, really pertains to uh, your 
time and um, the things that you've been doing um, and where you're kind of going to travel this summer and this spring because I feel like right now I am so tired of the weather. <laughs> um, it's yeah. too cold for April and I'm, I, we just all deserve to be warm at this point. So yes, um, yes. real quick, where are you going this summer and spring? Well, I don't want to make you too jealous. Okay. However, okay. <laughs> I'm going to go to some warmer climates. Uh, first, um, <laughs> at the end of this month, I will be traveling to Kenya with my colleagues on the Empowered Youth Project. Mm -hmm. So uh, with colleagues from MSU and then colleagues from several universities in, um, in Ken Kenya. Okay. Awesome. And then um, also I'm going to be traveling to Benin again okay. in May mm -hmm. as part of the PIRA grant that we have through the Alliance for African Partnership. Oh, that's amazing. I'm, yeah. I am jealous. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. We've lived through this for this winter for too long. No, know? it's been too long, and yeah. we're going to get through it. But yes. it's almost over. That's the, the point and the goal, I hope. Yeah. Um, okay, so in terms of Benin, can you explain your research there and kind of the things that you did and how that kind of transitioned you into wanting to pursue a career in higher education? Sure. So, um, my interest in Benin came when I was an undergrad, mm -hmm. and um, I was an undergrad at Wayne State. Sorry, MSU. That's okay. <laughs> hey, I'll say forgive you. Right? <laughs> um, but I had a professor who had been doing work in Benin since the 1960s, oh, yeah. and I was just interested in general in the idea of migration for education. Oh, yeah. So when we leave our parents' home or our family's home to go to university, do we go back? Mm -hmm. Do we go back? Do we? you know, reintegrate into our community or sort of like leave ties. And um, thankfully I was part of a program that was called the McNair Scholars Program, okay. which is um, a U.S. Uh, funded program for underrepresented groups to prepare mm -hmm. you for grad school. Right. And at that time I had been a returning student um, and was just starting to feel like maybe I had something to contribute to um, sort of higher education and right. starting to feel like, do I belong here? Mm -hmm. Is this something that I can do? And so that program was fantastic because they not only helped us with like the logistics of grad school, like how do you apply? How do you figure out where you want to go? But they also gave us um, funding to do research, right. to do original research, right. where you come up with the idea and you have a faculty member who helps you along. So I'd had this wonderful um, faculty member who I'd taken a class with who I said, I want to study migration for education. And the funny thing is, mm -hmm. I wanted to do this in Tanzania, because right. I had recently been to Tanzania on just a vacation, and I thought, I talked to someone who told me his story, his sort of like education story, as well mm -hmm. as his aspirations for the future. Right. And it seemed to me that what he wanted to do was give back to his family. Mm -hmm. He also knew that he lived in a pretty remote area on this island called Nungui. And he's like, so if I pass middle school, I'm mm -hmm. going to go to high school. And he's like, that's pretty far because the high school was maybe 20 miles away, right? right? Then he's like, and if I pass high school, I'm going to go to university. That's on the mainland, so I'm going to be even further. Right. And he's like, but I want to do it because I want to help my family. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about this idea of migration for education. Mm -hmm. But when I asked my professor, who was going to be my mentor, right yeah, I want to do this research in, in Tanzania. He's like, oh, great. I don't know anybody in Tanzania. Right. <laughs> he's like, I do my research in, in Benin. So if you're interested in that topic, he said, I've been seeing this happening right. um, over the past, you know, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So you might want to do that there. So he gave me the, um, the introductions, and I actually went um, on my own, right. but as wow. a, an independent study abroad to, to first mm -hmm. study migration for education right. um, and I'm forever grateful because it really that changed my trajectory okay, right. you know that's amazing yeah and then in terms of like that actual research so it was m based in migration or did it kind of evolve as you did it <laughs> right. it started out as a migration right. um, and so like that was kind of where I was heading with my initial McNair mm -hmm. research but then, um, because of that, then I applied to Michigan State's PhD program mm -hmm. in anthropology, and I was able to go back and do the pre-dissertation work, and then I did um, a language program in Benin. And each time I went, it sort of shifted my understanding, right. um, and I wanted to get a broader view of not just migration for mm -hmm. education, but what education means for the entire extended family. Right. 
especially if you have someone who's maybe the first in their family to go. Of course, yeah. And I felt like I kind of had a, a connection to that topic because I was the first in my family to go. So I knew the challenges I had faced. Some of those were like, do I belong here? Right. Um, how am I going to pay for this? Oh, for sure. <laughs> right? Um, uh, am I as smart as everybody else? Hmm. Do they belong here and maybe I don't? So that sort of, you know, we know that every researcher goes into the field with their own biases and like right. their own interests, right? Mm -hmm. So I found that I was asking questions that also related to my experience. Oh, yeah. And mine wasn't so much about migration as it was about being the first person in your family to right. go to college. So that sort of got into more interesting conversations with people. Right. As anthropologists, it's like our method is um, ethnographic, you know, mm -hmm. interviews and what we call deep hanging out. Oh, yeah. So like hang out with people, observe first, mm -hmm. try to understand, and then you start to have conversations with people to sort of tease out the meanings between what people maybe say and what they do or like why would people do one thing versus another. Right. So as a result of all those conversations, like we went in every direction, direction right? <laughs> like I, I, was, I was hanging out with students on the campus as well as in dorm rooms, as well as in classrooms and with people who are at higher levels, like people who work for UNICEF or for the Ministry of Education. Right. And that sort of like took my my research into this that other realm. So it just shifted over time, but right. sort of naturally, I guess. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so with that, I think that a really cool thing that you said was in regards to education and kind of like your feelings towards wanting to be or feel like you were worth being here and like that mm -hmm. whole mindset there. What do you think the power of education is, especially when you're coming from a place of you're the first person in your family to go to college or to pursue a higher education? And I think that um, a lot of people do tend to gloss over what a privilege it is to be able to get an education. And I think that there's a lot of nuances between and within the whole process of that. So I guess, I'm sorry that that was such a yeah. long question, but no, it's what fine. do you think for you specifically, and I guess for people that you have interacted with, the power of pursuing that and getting an education that's more expansive, like how does that impact you, if that makes sense? <laughs> yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And it's almost like there's two sides of it. Mm -hmm. There's the one side where you're like, I feel so lucky and I'm gonna have this thing, right? It's gonna right. be my degree. And as they say, once you have it, nobody can take it away from mm -hmm. you, right? Um, and it's sort of something that validates something you may know about yourself, right? right? I can do this. And I did all this hard work that mm -hmm. got me to get that degree. Then sometimes there's also that other part where you're like, because I'm the only one in my family to go, maybe sometimes my family doesn't get all of the struggle that I put into this. Or sometimes, right. um, you know, family members might not to recognize why. Yeah. Why is it important? And for me, I found it important because it really did provide that sort of external validation of what I thought, which is, I think I can do this. Right. I think there have been things in my life that had led me to believe that high school was difficult for me. I had challenges in my family and I didn't graduate from high school mm -hmm. and it made me, I had a, oh gosh, how many years? I got my GED when I was 23. Right. So like that's several years of sort of wandering around and thinking I have certain skills, I have things that I can contribute to this world, mm -hmm. but without a high school diploma, it's right. difficult for other people to believe you, yeah. take you at your word to say, oh, you've got potential, mm -hmm. you can do something cool, right? right? Or you've got like skills or you've right. got, or that you're intelligent enough to mm -hmm. do the job. And then taking it further to be like, okay, not only did I get that high school um, GED, so like the equivalent, but I think I can do this thing in, in university, which mm -hmm. causes you to think on this different level, right? right? Like to me, I feel like, primary and secondary or like elementary and mm -hmm. high school, they teach you some of the things you need to know. Sure. I feel like higher education teaches you how to critically think mm -hmm. and to think about how to learn. Okay. Yeah, if that makes sure. sense. Right? Does, like, I mean, I know there's a lot of classes where you, you learn specific things. Yeah. But in many of our classes, we're taught to think critically and to be able to talk about the things that we're learning about in a way that we can disseminate that information to other people. Right. And I feel like that's really important. 
okay. not just learning for our own sake, mm -hmm. but learning in a way to take that knowledge and to make the world a better place. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for answering. Sure. Because <laughs> that was perfect. Um, I guess within that, um, I really want to ask a question nuanced within the timeline aspect because I know you talked about not getting your um, not graduating from college, getting a GED, or from high school and getting a GED. Yeah. Um, I think that a big portion of like life right now is having this specific timeline of you know you go to primary school and then you get a higher education and yeah. for me specifically I am a second generation college student so I was mm -hmm. always placed in a situation where I kind of had pressures from my family <laughs> saying like this is what you do and this is how you get through life because this right. is what we did um, and I guess for you since you had such a different kind of way into um, a approaching your career, how does yeah. that affect you? Or how, what advice do you have for people that don't technically take a traditional path in getting an education or pursuing a career on the, how the societal, like, do it this way, if that makes yeah, sense? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's a really great question for right now. Yeah. Because we know that the pandemic has caused a disruption in people's timelines, mm -hmm. right? And, sure. and the things that we thought that we were going to do at maybe the beginning of the year 2020 where we sort of could project our next two years, many of us would never have said, this is where we're going to be in two years, right? right. <laughs> we're in a very different place. Um, but I think that it helps us to understand the flexibility that we do have. And so as you're talking about timelines, mm -hmm. you know, when I came back um, and got my GED, like I said, I was 23. Right. So I already felt like I was behind. Mm -hmm. um, but the question is like behind what? Yeah. Yes, I, I did not have, um, I, you know, it took me to that point to have a GED so then I could get jobs that required that, right? Right. But I had gained knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important. When we're even thinking about like the work that I do, sometimes the work that I do is with people who would be considered low literate. Right. People, and I, I like that terminology versus illiterate. Yeah. Illiterate is like, oh, you know, you can have like a bias against that and, yeah. and act like that person isn't smart or intelligent. Right. It just means that they haven't acquired a specific type of knowledge mm -hmm. that maybe they wanted to, maybe they ha wanted, didn't have the opportunity to or whatever. But anyway, that's sort of a, a side point in terms of thinking right. about like what we have um, inside of us and the experiences that we have. Mm -hmm. So when I started going to college, I went as um, a, I was working full time and I went to community college at night. All right. And that took a really long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got really frustrated at times. Yeah. Like, I really got frustrated because I thought, like, I want this to go faster. Yeah. But in my classes, when we were, you know, working through problems or looking at case studies, I had so many things that I had experienced in life that I could draw upon. Right. That I didn't really realize until pretty far along that that was. Um, I wouldn't say an advantage, but it was something that helped me to understand the material better. Right. And so if we can kind of reframe our thinking of timelines, not as rigid, right. but as like the meandering path that life takes and, right. the, and, and thinking of all of these experiences as ways for us to take knowledge in that may be inside the classroom, may be outside of the classroom. Right. So for those who took a gap year, mm -hmm. you know, Reflect back on what you learned in that gap year. Or reflect on, oh, many people spent much more time with family. Right. Right? Like, how do we integrate all of that into our learnings for whatever we're learning in school? So yeah. I, I feel like um, having had that experience helps me to understand, too, that timelines are just that. Like, a lot of times internally, right. you know, like, oh, I have to do this by this age. Oh, yeah. And no, like, there's so much more if we can just sort of let those go right. and be like, things are going to happen in their time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be flexible. I'm not mm -hmm. going to beat myself up right. over like not meeting a timeline. Oh, for sure. I think that's important. I agree. And yeah. I, I completely agree with you because from my perspective, I think that a lot of time when I speak to people that are near my age and doing things, I think that there's a huge stigma around kind of you're not doing this at this time when I am. And right. that means that you're not as you're not going to be as successful as I am or all this right. other stuff that has nothing to do with your experience. And like you said, I think a really huge part for, I guess, young people to understand is like, even if you're not doing 
something that is specific to I'm going to college to get a higher education. There are other things that you can do to become educated because I think that people um, attach education as synonymous to being intelligent or to gaining mm -hmm. intelligence when you can be educated and not know anything going on in the world. Right. So that's a yeah. huge thing. I think that um, your experience specifically is really cool and such a great guide for people that aren't taking a specifically traditional path. Not that you didn't, but, um, yeah. but I think it's really important for people to understand the role of experience mm -hmm. and how experiences can be varied and, like I said, have different nuances and how, where you are now is like, you're <laughs> super successful in my opinion. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, pursuing a degree in high, or pursuing or a career in higher edu education, sorry, excuse yeah. me. Um, so that's really cool. And I guess based on that um, aspect of the experience, can you mm -hmm. speak more to your projects and the things that you've been able to do um, through your career? And sure, that? yeah. So, um, you know, I went to, um, I did my research for my PhD in Benin, um, and I was able to get a Fulbright uh, for that, so that was right. that was really cool and exciting, and and, mm -hmm. um, and I got to spend, you know, a nice chunk of time in Benin and met some great colleagues there. So one of the things that came out of that was a few years later, some of my colleagues in Benin and I created a nonprofit, and it's an NGO in Benin, mm -hmm. um, and it's now a 501c3 in, in the U.S. Wow. So, so that's really excited, uh, exciting, and it's called the Three Sisters, Les mm -hmm. Trois Sœurs. And so a few years ago, my colleagues were invited to the Global Youth Advancement Summit mm -hmm. and to present their research, right. and um, that was really uh, amazing. And, and for them to be able to be with other young people from around the world who are also like thinking of those same big issues, mm -hmm. how to make the world a better place, more equitable. Right. Um, so that's been a really um, rewarding and like exhausting at times right. oh, um, sure. uh, side, side project. And then now I am involved um, not just in the Department of Anthropology and um, you know was the advisor for Peace and Justice mm -hmm. Studies, which was fantastic mm -hmm. because that got me involved with other areas on campus like ARCA, mm -hmm. the Residential College in Arts and Humanities, right. and the work that Dean um, Steve Esquith done on peace building. Right. That um, put me in contact with colleagues, so now um, we're co-PIs on a project through the AAP, the Alliance for African Partnership. Right. Uh, we've got one of the PIRA grants for um, peace building through youth and engagement in mm -hmm. Francophone West Africa. Wow. So working with colleagues in Mali and in Benin, on community engagement mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of taking the learnings from what we've done with Les Trois Sœurs and what our colleagues Dr. Willori Tambura is doing with her students mm -hmm. in Mali on um, youth peace building, right. which is awesome. Um, and then also now I'm working with Global Ideas here mm -hmm. at Michigan State and um, Global Ideas has been really wonderful for me in terms of career-wise understanding more of the big picture right. and working on projects that are um, youth and higher education, um, and the one I mentioned, the Empowered Youth Project mm -hmm. in Kenya, we are now um, working on a pilot called Empowered Girls. Wow. With um, young women, um, adolescent to girls between mm -hmm. 15 and 19 years old, who are also out of school, right. um, who are, we're, we're working on life skills mm -hmm. and self-esteem, and, and I feel like it really like, kind of brings it right back, right? right. Like, I, I can relate to these girls right. that, that there was you know something in my life that caused me to stop going to high school mm -hmm. but I felt like inside me I had something to offer right. and and so like being able to to work with young people to be like yes I mm -hmm. believe that you do have that inside right. you and like you have so much to give and so much to offer this world it's super rewarding so and and, and I wouldn't be able to do that on my own right yeah. it's part of this bigger project with Michigan State. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So like from your, I guess, answers and statements, a lot of what you do is based in mentorship. So like mm -hmm. mentoring yeah. youth and I guess like creating opportunities there. Yeah. How did that, how did your, I guess, like research and role and all of the things that you've done um, kind of transition you into taking on a role as a mentor for so many different people? And I guess also, what does that feel like to have so much experiences in different um, mm. fields and like kind of bring all these diverse experiences together and then get to actually help people that are also on the track to doing similar things or doing great things as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that does make sense. Um, 
it feels great. You know, <laughs> like I, and I think that I had, I had such a wonderful mentor um, in Dr. Montalus who, um, you know, taught me as an undergrad about reciprocity. Right. And so uh, he's an anthropologist and he, um, he taught me two concepts that I will never forget. One of them is reciprocity mm -hmm. and the other one is liminality. Okay. Um, so reciprocity, you know, he, he talks about this in the anthropological way, which mm -hmm. is like reciprocity is not, I give you a gift that is like, let's say, um, I'm going to give you a cake right. and you immediately give me a cake back. Mm -hmm. That's not reciprocity. That's just an exchange, right. right? But the idea that maybe you give me something mm -hmm. that I need at that moment and maybe there's a long time between then and when I can give you something back right. or I can give you something back that's not equal. It's what I can give right. at that point mm -hmm. and that's reciprocity. Right. And he's taught me that in terms of like our field work and, and you know when we're coming into communities, that reciprocity. But also I think about it in terms of like he has given me so much mm -hmm. over the years and he spent time right. on me. He believed in me and did mm -hmm. all these things. And maybe I'm not going to give that back to him, right? right? <laughs> but maybe it's, it's that reciprocity that I can give that to somebody else who needs what I can give right now. Mm -hmm. And it changes and it shifts over time, what right. I can give and, and what I can, you know, I'm still in the, I'm still his mentee, right. you know, and, and he's retired now. Mm -hmm. But um, so I feel like it was from him that I learned that. Right. And that second concept that he taught and he drilled into us was liminality. Okay. This betwixt in between. Right. And I feel like um, I love that. Yeah. I love that idea of like being between two stages. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like sometimes a mentor is, right? right? A mentor is betwixt and between because let's say it's you and you've got an, uh, a problem okay. between you and someone else or you've got a challenge. Mm -hmm. Then this mentor is in that liminal space. They're not right. going to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they might give you some suggestions. They're not going to do it for you. Right. But they're going to be sort of this conduit between you and the solution to the problem. Right. And, and so I, learning that from him and being in a space where I can give that back is important. Mm -hmm. And my, the most rewarding thing is now seeing some of the people mm -hmm. that I've been able to mentor, now seeing them do that for other right. people. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so, so awesome. Um, I guess with that, I think that one of the major takeaways that I took from what you were saying was um, in terms of like reciprocity, I think it's also really important to kind of understand that like you can't always give people everything back because mm -hmm. like yeah. from your perspective you're saying that you couldn't necessarily give say he gave you a cake you might not have been able to give him the cake back but you could get give something else and as you kind of progress and move forward like you might be able to give back some other way and I think that as a student and from like a youth perspective I have nothing to give, <laughs> like for real, because I'm <laughs> just getting through college. And I right. think that um, one of the things that I think is really important is kind of accepting that you are worth, not to say it's an inconvenience, but you are worth the time that people put into you. Um, yeah. Because like you're doing, you're giving back some way, some form, even if it's not directly to him, you're giving yeah. it to other people. And I think that's such a cool and great, like, full circle moment. So thank you so much yeah. for that. <laughs> thank you. Um, no problem. Uh, the next question I kind of have for you is in relation to youth advice. So, like, mm -hmm. what, what things do you think that in your past you believe that, like, you wish somebody had told you as you were kind of navigating um, the space of pursuing your career and pursuing your goals and kind of figuring out who you were in relation to what you're doing in your life? Mm. <laughs> I know that's a giant yeah, question. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's good. I, I do wish that I had heard more often mm -hmm. that I had more to give. Okay. You know? Right. That people didn't um, discount me because of the fact that I didn't have. I wish that people had looked more at me in terms of assets and mm -hmm. told me about all of the things I could offer right. rather than reminding me of the deficits. Right. You don't have this. You don't have that. Right. You don't have that. And if I could have told myself to believe in what I thought deep inside, which is I have something to offer, right. like believe in yourself and, and don't, don't, let, don't let the haters get you down. Oh, for like, sure. <laughs> you know, because there will always be haters in life. Oh, for sure. Unfortunately. Yeah. But there will also always be people who are looking at you 
as someone that they admire, right? right? There's always people who from afar are like, wow, I wish I could do this like that person or mm -hmm. whatever. But we don't often tell each other. Right. And like if we could tell each other more often, mm -hmm. like, hey, you're really cool or you're really smarter or like you spoke out in class and that was really cool. I was scared to ask that question. Right. That that I wish that like I had had a little bit more of. Okay. Yeah. And I feel like intrinsically just seeing you now, I feel like mm -hmm you overcame that to a certain degree, yeah. and I hope yeah. that that's the truth, um, because yeah. that's how you come off. Um, I guess within that, a really important question I have is how did you kind of do that? Like, how did you come from a place, because obviously, like, people aren't saying that. People, more people are mm -hmm. telling you and pointing out the negatives of your experiences and how you don't have certain things, but how did you kind of overcome that within yourself and work towards being like, oh, well, I do have the worth and as I work forward and as I move forward, I belong where I'm going, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that there are um, people who've been champions. Right. You know, like it's, certain people have said, I believe in you. Right. And it is like though, you don't know how important that is mm -hmm. to have like those, I mean you do, like right. people do, but, but maybe people who are thinking about saying that to other people don't realize how important it is, right. especially to somebody who might have had so many things telling them that the opposite. Right. So I think that um, uh, Chinwe, mm -hmm. F. Young, yeah. believed in us mm -hmm. and said, this is a great project, this is something you should do. Like that was one of the first external people to the project that I was working on that said like, I respect this person um, so much and I can't believe that they even said that they even know who I am and what I'm doing mm -hmm. so unfortunately some of it was external yeah. but some of it in the beginning for me was um, I had friends and this is before I even had you know gotten my GED right. and I had a friend who was in grad school mm -hmm. who asked me to help with a paper right. and I was like wait a minute here hmm I think <laughs> I might be smart enough to go to college, right. right? Or it was like my sister who said, why don't you come to this class I'm taking mm -hmm. at community college and just see. Mm -hmm. So it was like going there and seeing like, I think I can do this. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so I think it was like, it was a slow process. Yeah. It wasn't like immediately as soon as yeah. I got into, um, got into um, university that I was like, ooh. Right. It was like a, because there's that big thing with imposter syndrome mm -hmm. too, you know? Yeah, it's huge. Feeling like everybody else belongs there and you mm -hmm. don't. And even if you're getting good grades, you sometimes feel like, well, maybe the professor felt bad for me. And right, that's yeah. why they gave me the grade, yeah, right? Sure. But so it, it does take a while to sort of do, get rid of the negative self talk mm -hmm. and to be like, no, I belong here. I have right. something to contribute. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So it, it's a process. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, and also I think that's, like, really important because I feel that even as just, like, a student here, um, there are a lot of times where I've been, like, even though people have always told me, you know, this is where you're going, this is where you're headed, um, and you definitely belong here, there's always going to be something that's, like, whether it's a class or whether it's somebody that you're comparing yourself to because you're both yeah. in the same situation and in the same environment, it's like, yeah. mm, maybe I don't. But yeah. I think having that having that both external and internal source of saying like let me push past this and let me show what I can do even if you don't end up getting the best grade in the class I think that's really important to just keep going yeah and that's to your point like your story I don't right. know I'm very yeah, inspired by <laughs> everything that you're saying and especially your experience because I think it's really important and pertinent to um, young people now but also just with the situation the climate that we're in yeah. There's just so much that is changing, and I feel like there's a societal standard of just because this is changing doesn't mean you shouldn't be here in this specific position. So, yeah, no, I think perseverance is huge. Right. Like, and it's sort of underestimated. Like, that perseverance doesn't mean like I'm going to persevere in these four years. I'm going to work so hard, and I'm going right. to be done. It's like perseverance is like when there's a massive challenge, or when you feel like I don't think I can do this to keep doing it anyway oh, yeah. <laughs> you know sure. so like I and I like that that there's more discussion of like our mental health now right and for students like mm -hmm. dealing with the pressure of 
classes and grades and friends and pandemic and you know like what am I going to do afterwards and right. where's the world headed like there's, it's a lot it and I'm I'm just so happy that like it's so much more of a conversation now about mm -hmm. mental health that it's like this is not something to hide right like right. if we're feeling frustrated or if we're feeling like down on ourselves like we can talk about it mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that we're weak right. it doesn't mean that we're you know not going to be able to make it it's like no i'm going to acknowledge what's going on right and then let's persevere and work through it awesome yeah my last question for you is in terms of i guess advice for youth and also if you had anything else to share um what kind, what kind of advice would you give to someone like me or to somebody that um, is kind of transitioning and moving to the next stage of their life? Um, whether it be pursuing higher education or higher, higher education right. or getting a job or getting a career, or doing something in the space that just is, you're done with, I guess, this specific experience of um, college or education. What would you, yeah. what is your advice to like move forward with that? I would say look broad okay. you know like just if your degree is in this area mm -hmm. think broadly about what that degree can do for you and what you learned in like the breadth um, and depth of what you learned okay. and don't narrow it down to being like I only am going to excel in a career that looks like this right. um, because you I feel like if you open yourself up to sort of meanderings Mm -hmm. You're gonna find your find your way, okay. and also don't be afraid if something like, let's just say you you graduate and you pursue a career and you're you're working in it. And you're like, but it's related to my degree, so I mm -hmm. got to do it. Right. Um, don't feel like that has to be your only path. Okay. Like, life will take you in in certain directions and kind of like be be open to those directions and always reflect on like, what did I learn through the whole experience? Right. Not just in my classes, okay. but like, what did I learn here? And for us, it would be like, what did I learn here at Michigan State? Right. You know, it, like as part of that big, broad mm -hmm. picture. And then you won't feel like, because if you only think, I got a degree in marketing, so therefore I have to work in marketing. Mm -hmm. If you decide that you're going to do something later that draws upon the broader knowledge that you got at Michigan State, you'd feel like, oh, I failed because I didn't do marketing, right? Right. But if you're like, Oh, I wanted to do marketing, and now I think I want to go into um, maybe something that has to do with PR for a nonprofit, right? Sure. <laughs> like it's marketing. Maybe it wasn't your official, you know, subfield that you mm -hmm. you studied, but you're drawing on that bigger body of knowledge, and it's taking you in a place where you can really apply it in a way that means something to you. Right. Thank you so, so much. Sure. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Do you have anything left that you want to promote, share? Um, well. I do work with um, some entrepreneurs. So as mm -hmm. I said, that um, sis three sisters Toisseur is right. um, you know registered in in the U.S. and in, in um, Benin, but we also work with artisans in sure. Niger, so um, who live in this area outside of Agadez. So they're mm -hmm. um, pretty much in the Sahara, and it's a group of artisans who've done amazing work. Um, they look a lot at um, the impact of what they do on the environment, mm -hmm. and so they've made some really cool things. I want to show you this. Um, Super cool cup made of soapstone, hand carved, if you can feel with your nail. That is um, beautiful. Really cool, right? Um, so I love working with artisans who also can like take, mm -hmm. so this was something that was a custom design. Right. Um, where they use designs like this often um, that they told me to signify sort of like the way that the sand moves on mm -hmm. the Sahara, which is pretty cool. That's beautiful. Um, but into a shape that, that we needed for one of our projects. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also the see. spoon, right? Yes. Um, I love to cook. Yeah. So I when when actually when the um, when Ali and his crew were working on these cups, mm -hmm. they sent a picture of everybody sort of on break, mm -hmm. and a couple of the guys had like a spoon, and I was like, wait a minute. So you need that. <laughs> going on with the spoon. <laughs> so yeah, and so um, then we started carrying these spoons, which are also cool, and again hand carved mm -hmm. um, and burned, and they're from acacia trees. So it's right. it's rare when you can actually see the tree that right. you're product came from mm -hmm. and every time when there's a new order you know Ali will go take the camera take a video and be like this is the tree right. and I get to see it all the way through from like mm -hmm. the tree to the final product um, and then the last thing is the the bag over there hand woven from um, natural grasses and uh, the women in the collective 
work on these, and um, and they're awesome as well. So I just got a picture the other day of mm -hmm. these grasses, and then they were like, you know, right. see everybody weaving them, which is which is cool, and it's nice to get to know the community. So like, right. I know everyone. We send messages back mm -hmm. and forth, and it's it's pretty cool. Right. So yeah, these are the last few things. I that love. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love working with creative people. You know. Oh, for sure. And again, this is like. If somebody years ago, when I said, I'm going to study migration for education, mm -hmm. would I have ever said right. that this is what I'd be doing? You know, I would never have guessed that. Yeah. But being open to the way that life twists and turns and like what education means. Mm -hmm. and, and Ali and his family and everyone in the collective, there's like 300 people who live there, um, do this and mm -hmm. sell these so that they can send their kids to school, so they right. can pay the school fees so that they can have the books right mm -hmm. so education seems to be like the central thread right but what education means and how right. creative it can be and how community-led mm -hmm. something that you know we would never have been able to tell from the beginning no truly thank yeah. you so much and these are actually so beautiful and I yeah. like I said um, when I become a real adult <laughs> after this experience <laughs> this is the type of stuff that I want in my house so like for sure but thank you so it. much. Yeah, uh, that concludes you, our Jason. Global Voices Spotlight interview. Yeah. Um, I had a great time. Me too. From you, and I yeah. really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Yeah, thank and, you yeah. so much. Thank you.